Ja, guten Abend. Ich freue mich, Sie hier am Kollegium Helvetikum zu einer Kooperation von Literaturhaus, des Lehrstuhls Dommann an der Uni Zürich, des Lehrstuhls Hagner an der ETH und der Konstanz University und uns zu begrüßen. Also ich finde das mal schon mal ein schönes Setting der Kooperation. Ich erlaube mir dies auf Deutsch zu tun, nachdem im Vorfeld des heutigen Anlasses in einer Mail die Sprachenfrage so erörtert wurde, dass neben Englisch auch, Zitat, German, langsam und einfach, in Klammer, or French, a little faster, benutzt werden könnten. Für mich persönlich ist der heutige Tag, ist heute der Tag der Statistiken, Kurven, Karten und Stammbäume, während diese, die ersten beiden Drittel dieses Tages, ganz im Zeichen eines, wie Swiss Universities, Swiss Universities, Universities titelte, Swiss Way to Research Quality standen und verbunden waren mit Buzzwords wie Impact, Exzellenz, Qualität, Wirksamkeit, Wissensproduktion und dergleichen, geht es heute Abend also nun um Statistiken, Kurven, Karten, Stammbäume etc. im Dienste der Literaturwissenschaft. Das Collegium Helvetikum ist gewissermaßen doppelt geeignet, den heutigen Anlass zu beherbergen. Die Verbindung von Big Data mit Literatur passt nicht nur ideal in unser eben angelaufenes fünf oder genauer viereinhalb Jahres Thema Digital Societies, sondern auch bestens zum Ort, in dem wir uns befinden. Hier in der ehemaligen eidgenössischen Sternwarte wurde von deren Inbetriebnahme 1864 bis 1980, als der Betrieb wegen des ungünstig gewordenen Standortes aufgegeben wurde, hier wurde im vordigitalen Zeitalter quasi Big Data zu Sonnenflecken gesammelt und berechnet. Ein Datenkorpus, das unter der Bezeichnung Wolf Number bis heute bekannt ist und in bereinigter Form das historische Ausgangsmaterial des International Sunspot Index liefert. Doch ich will nicht weiter ausholen, sondern mit einer kurzen Bemerkung zur Choreografie dann gleich an Gesa Schneider übergeben, die den heutigen Abend moderieren wird. Der Ablauf ist so vorgesehen, dass nach einer kurzen Einführung zunächst Franco Moretti spricht. Ich sage nicht, wie viel Zeit vorgesehen ist, lassen Sie sich von der Viertelstunde überraschen. Dass dann kurze Kommentare von Bernd Stiegler und Albrecht Koschorke kommen. Franco Moretti respondieren wird, dann endlich das Publikum zum Zuge kommen soll, damit dann Monika Dommann zum Schluss und Michael Hagen zum Very Schluss noch einmal kurz bündeln zusammenfassen werden. Nun übergebe ich aber an Gesa Schneider. Herz, vielen herzlichen Dank, Herr Hingartner. Sie sehen, es wird gar nicht so viel für mich zu moderieren geben. Ich freue mich sehr, dass ich auf Einladung von Michael Hagner hier als Vertreterin des Literaturhauses da sein darf, dass diese Veranstaltung jetzt gemeinsam stattfindet mit ETH Zürich, mit Universität Zürich, dem Literaturhaus der Konstanz University Press. Für diejenigen, die das Literaturhaus nicht kennen, ist es am Limatke. Ah, jetzt hört man mich. Wahrscheinlich noch besser. Okay. Gut. Und ähm, wir machen circa 130 Veranstaltungen pro Jahr. Und äh, in, all, in der, deren Namen begrüße ich jetzt Sie herzlich hier in der Sternwarte und zu einem Abend der akademischen Schwergewichtsklasse, kann man sagen. Jetzt hört man mich aber. Ja, natürlich. Gut. Wie lesen haben wir unsere Veranstaltung genannt und wie lesen ist auch im, interessant, im Kontext des Literaturhauses insofern interessant, dass wir als Veranstalter und Kuratorinnen eigentlich selten über das Wie nachdenken und mehr über das Was. Jetzt bekomme ich ein Thumbs up ähm, wegen dem Sound. Interessant auch über Distant Reading zu sprechen und zwar hier in der Sternwarte und jetzt wiederhole ich mich oder beziehungsweise wiederhole ich Sie, weil ähm, hier wurden wie gesagt Sonnenflecken beobachtet. Es gab vielleicht so den Wunsch oder der, 
ähm, wie soll ich sagen, die Sehnsucht nach so etwas wie reiner Beobachtung und diese äh, Sternwarte ist ja schon seit Jahrzehnten nicht mehr in Betrieb, also sie stellt auch eine Form der Vergangenheit her und da, über die es sich durchaus lohnen würde, länger nachzudenken. Und äh, Franco Moretti hat ja mit Distant Reading ein Buch geschrieben, auch eine Reihe von Aufsätzen versammelt, die nichts weniger wollen, als die Literaturwissenschaft unter neuen Gesichtspunkten zu verhandeln. Mir war dabei wichtig, auch auf die Form seines Textes zu achten. Das Ich kommt da sehr häufig vor. Seine Mitarbeiter werden alle aufgezählt. Erkenntnis entsteht an Konferenzen und im Gespräch und im Dialog und mit produktivem Widerspruch. Ich bin ein Kind der Akademie der 90er Jahre und ich kann sagen, ich erinnere mich nicht daran, viele wissenschaftliche Texte gelesen zu haben, in denen äh, auf diese Art und Weise Form und Zeiten des Entstehens und des Arbeitens am Text transparent gemacht werden. Zum einen also, wenn ich lese, dann mache ich das nach wie vor in einem Close Reading Prinzip. Ich kann nicht anders, aber was könnte ich jetzt aus diesem Ich, zum Beispiel aus dieser Beobachtung machen, dass dieses Ich da im Text so oft erscheint? Ich könnte zum Beispiel eine Anzahl wissenschaftlicher Texte der 90er Jahre oder der 2000er Jahre nehmen und sie auf das Vorkommen des Wortes Ich prüfen, sie quasi durch ein Raster schicken, durch ein nationales Raster, durch ein Zeitraster, das vergleichen beispielsweise mit Texten, die in Science und Nature erscheinen, äh, vergleichen mit Texten aus dem europäischen oder außereuropäischen Kontext und mich dann fragen, was das sagen würde über uns, was das für einen Erkenntnismehrwert generieren würde. Was mich also auch an, an diesem Text besonders interessiert, neben diesen kleinen Beobachten sind drei Dinge, wie Zeit und Raum verhandelt werden, wie die Frage und die Frage, wie Weltliteratur ähm, über mögliche andere Lesensverfahren angedacht wird und was das für die Zukunft der Literaturwissenschaft bedeuten könnte. Ich bin auch sehr gespannt, wie sich die heute Abend Diskutierenden dazu positionieren werden. Was ich etwas verwundert zur Kenntnis genommen habe, sind die sich einschleichenden Werturteile. Kundera beispielsweise ist schlecht, Spielberg ist auch schlecht und eine Kultur, die so etwas hervorbringt, sollte, so ich das verstehe, eigentlich gar nicht erhalten bleiben. Äh, Franco Moretti hat einen vielbeachteten Vortrag im Cabaret Voltaire gehalten. Dieses Frühjahr hat das Stanford Literary Lab gegründet und ist momentan, soweit ich weiß, immer noch auch an der Uni Genf beschäftigt. Er hat dort einen Work, also einen Einblick, einen Work in Progress gegeben, The World According to the Bank, The Language of World Bank Reports. Darauf wäre ich sehr gespannt. Und auch das letzte Buch, The Bourgeois Between History and Literature, das schon erschienen ist, wo ich aber noch nicht reingeguckt habe. Ich freue mich sehr, dass die Universität Konstanz heute vertreten ist. Ich habe mal im ähm, Vorlesungsverzeichnis des Wintersemesters, habe ich mal versucht auszuwerten, geguckt, findet da sowas wie Distant Reading statt und äh, man findet nach wie man findet Dinge wie narrative Grundmuster, aber auch sehr viel exemplarische Erzählanalysen, Niederungen von Hertha Müller oder Adalbert Stifters Erzählungen, die Lyrik der Moderne, das Gegenwartstheater, ähm, die europäische Novelle, Dramatik im Mittelalter bis zur Gegenwart, also doch eine relativ westlich geprägte, äh, soll ich sagen, äh, Literaturwissenschaft, die sich, das sage ich jetzt mal provokativ, auch anhand sehr weniger Texte einen möglichst großen Erkenntnismehrwert erhofft. Ähm, was auch quasi eigentlich aus der Tradition bin ich eigentlich auch hervorgekommen, muss ich muss ich sagen. Ich ähm, freue mich sehr, dass Albrecht Koschorke heute anfangen wird. Ich kann mich an einen Vortrag erinnern in Zürich, 1998 war das, glaube ich. Ähm, er hat die Forschungsstelle oder auch mitgegründet für Kulturtheorie und Theorie des politischen Imaginären und ähm, hat seit 2011 gibt es das Exzellenzcluster kulturelle Grundlagen von Integration und äh, hat sehr viele, ähm, sehr viel veröffentlicht, sehr viel über das, also das, was mich jetzt, ich habe jetzt leider, ist heute die Website der Uni Konstanz abgestürzt, muss ich dazu sagen. Genau heute, da stand dann, hm? 
Echt? Ja, es war wirklich äh, ein bisschen ein Leidensweg dann. Dann stand dann, ups. Ähm, Körperströme und Schriftverkehr, daran kann ich mich sehr gut erinnern. Und Bernd Stiegler ist ebenfalls Professor für neuere deutsche Literatur mit Schwerpunkt 20. Jahrhundert, sehr viel über Theorie der Fotografie veröffentlicht. Und äh, zuletzt auch, also letztlich ein Buch Spuren, Elfen und andere Erscheinungen, Conan Doyle. Also da ist auch eine Verknüpfung wieder mit äh, Moretti. Vielleicht kann man da über Spu werden wir über Spuren heute noch reden können. Und ähm, ich freue mich auch sehr, dass eben Monika Domann und Michael Hagner, die ich jetzt hier in dem Rahmen nicht ausführlich vorstellen werde, mitdiskutieren und der Ablauf sieht tatsächlich vor, dass Herr Moretti erst sprechen wird, dann Herr Koschorke, dann Herr Stiegler und im Anschluss Herr Moretti wieder respondieren, antworten wird und dann haben wir etwa noch eine halbe Stunde Zeit, um äh, Fragen von uns äh, zu formulieren. Vielen Dank und ich bitte Herrn Moretti auf die Bühne. All of you, uh, to you, to you, to you, for having published the book, to you all for being uh, here. So the evening is entitled uh, "Wie Lesen." The book is entitled "Distant Reading," and uh, you know I will just try to go over a few of the ideas that uh, led to this book and then led, maybe past, this book, beginning. For those of you, uh, I imagine many of you haven't um, seen the book, uh, the expression distant reading originated really as a joke. It was in a, uh, in a talk, in a paper, in an article that was about world literature. There was a much bigger issue uh, that I was worried about. And at a certain point, uh, there were uh, a few observations on methodology and the expression distant reading occurred to me. I used it, again, as a joke. No one cared about it. Uh, I didn't care about it. No one in the, in the audience uh, cared. No one noticed it, really. I mentioned it again, maybe a year or two later, writing something else, saying, well, you know, that was meant half as a joke, half in earnestly. Then somehow, what happened was, uh, a few years after this uh, piece, um, the whole digital humanities began being significant in the university and somehow distant reading became an alternative way of saying digital humanities. Uh, and then uh, it took a life of its own. It was often um, attacked, it was often praised and whatever. I mean, it's uh, um, in itself, it's, uh, uh, what does it mean? Well. There is a personal aspect, there is a, a, a general, the personal aspect is if I go to the movies, I sit in the last row. If I were here, I would sit where you are, Out, possibly, yeah, exactly, outside of the... It's a way of relating to what happens. There are some people who understand better if they are sitting or watching a movie right in front. There are some people, I belong to the second uh, type. Uh, maybe it has to do with the fact that mm, Understanding comes easier to me if I don't feel too involved, too overwhelmed by images and ideas. Uh, I, I suspect that that's uh, the reason. So uh, that is why distance, uh, so there's also other um, elements at play. I think it's in the Italian journey that Goethe says, whenever you arrive in a new city, the first thing you should do is climb the bell tower so you can see the city from above and you get the map of the city. I've always liked maps. Maps are a way of looking at a landscape at a distance. In fact, every map has a scale and a scale is really another name for a distance. Different scales mean that you move away or closer. Now, uh, on, uh, uh, when we Uh, look at maps on computers, this has become a, a, an immediate experience that, you know, scale means, uh, uh, miss distance, means distance. So it's a type of knowledge which is appropriate if you are interested in uh, understanding relatively large systems. Literary study has always been uh, tied uh, for perfectly 
reasonable uh, reasons, good reasons to relatively small systems, a book, a poem, um, a single text. Um, but, you know, if you try to look at a city, that's already a much larger systems of roads, buildings, uh, people moving, etc., etc. So, reading from a distance makes sense if you are interested in uh, looking at something that is larger than, uh, than a single text. Mm. Not everybody has to be interested in that. Um, it remains to be seen, uh, we may talk about this uh, later today, what is the relationship between what you see from afar and what you see from up close. Um, this is something that often comes up in discussion uh, in the United States. Are the two approaches uh, compatible or incompatible. You know, there is a very virtuous way of looking at the thing, which says, "Oh, they are perfectly complementary." One looks from afar. Uh, yes and no. I mean, in, uh, they could be perfectly complementary, but really, the choice means that you consider the most important aspects to be those that can be seen from afar or from down close. So there is not just a way of approaching the same object. There is a way of emphasizing for intellectual reasons, for epistemological reasons, different features in that object. Now, um, the book itself, Distant Reading, is uh, um, uh, it's different from anything else I've written. Uh, in that it is a very transitional text. It's a book. It's, uh, it collects 10 essays. Uh, one of them was written about 10 years earlier, but the others are, were all written in, in a matter of 10 years. And, uh, and actually, things change uh, very quickly. It felt a little bit like a snowball. The last sentence of my introduction to the distant reading book actually says, well, but, you know, at this point, this is really a different story which deserves a different book. So, you know, I myself understand that. Um, let me just at least sketch out for you what this snowball process was. I began, initially, I was interested, uh, uh, this is a book in which the study of literature has a lot to do with uh, um, let's say, scientific approaches, uh, without exaggerating with uh, scientific nature, but scientific approaches of different kind. And at the origin of it all was my conviction that evolutionary theory would be a great model for literary history because it is a theory which explains how forms change in time. And literary history also explains how forms change in time. I realize that the mechanisms then are in many extremely important ways different, but the general problem um, seems to be uh, comparable. And in, incidentally, it also once formulated like this, you realize something that is a thread throughout the book, throughout all my work really, which is that um, um, the idea that literary history, intellectual history perhaps, not just literary one, um, is a combination of morphology and historiography. So it's a combination, you have to try and manage to study simultaneously how forms are constructed and uh, at the same time, you know, their um, transformations across time usually, usually uh, by temperament um, uh, and also by practice, scholars tend to be either morphologists or historians. Um, for reasons that originate in other anecdotes, in accidents, etc., etc., I've always liked to try and be both. The end result was that I'm not a particularly good morphologist, I'm not a particularly good historian. The thing in between that I've managed to uh, become, um, well, it's not for me to evaluate, but uh, in a sense, the, the, uh, the aim of my work was to, has been to try and show how these two fields 
throw light on each other, even though they're very different. And I like to work uh, in that space in which the interaction between the two um, is activated. But so, evolutionary theory at the beginning, I wanted to understand uh, the transformations of literary forms across time. But by studying um, evolutionary theory, at least certain aspects of, uh, of that, um, I was com um, convinced by uh, Ernst Meyer that a very important aspect, uh, the origin of new species, the origins of new forms in the case of literature, um, has a geographical explanation in, in sort of, uh, uh, you know, he, he created a whole theory out of that. And so out of my evolutionary interest and interest in geography arose, and so I started, which I was inclined to because of my liking of maps to begin with, but you know, making literary maps made me understand that a map needs a lot of homogeneous data to be a good map, and so I had to look for the homogeneous data, which meant I started creating little and then later not so little series of homogeneous either textual or sociological data related to literature. So this then pushed me in the direction of quantitative study, and at that point, uh, um, you know, it's the, um, the arrival, so to speak, of uh, um, computational tools within the humanities occurred, and, uh, and that took me in uh, uh, a little farther along the way as well. So um, in this, it's really a story of um, instability of the categories. It has been extremely nice, extremely satisfying to always, you know, being forced to study uh, something else, uh, hoping that it would be the solution to the problem you had uh, before and then realizing that it creates its own problems and so on. Um, let me finish quickly, leaving something a little bit in, uh, um, in, in suspension. So it has been very nice. There has been a price and here, um, I don't want to preempt criticism by doing some self-criticism uh, myself, but it's something I've been thinking about a lot. Uh, and Albrecht knows that, you know, he, uh, our first meeting a couple of years ago in the United States, he was surprised at how uh, uh, sort of hard I talked about certain things I'd done. Let me put it in the, in the starkest possible ways. At the beginning of, my, of the work that's collected in this book, for me, the most important thing were explanations. Why was I interested in evolutionary theory? Because it was a fantastically intelligent explanation of certain phenomena. And I thought, that's more questionable, that it could also use for literary phenomena. Uh, the same applies to um, world systems theory, which is a little more esoteric. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's a Marxist American version of uh, Fernand Brodel's um, um, notion of history and uh, geography, sort of geographical um, history of uh, capitalism. These are conceptual models which explain what has happened and why it has happened in that way. Evolution explains more of the morphology, world systems theory explains more of the history, but there are overlaps between them, I mean, or overlaps and also clashes, but you know, there, there is a way to uh, inhabit them. So, at first, for me, the impulse and the interest in going in the direction of the natural sciences um, was due to the fact that they had come up with what seemed to me to be better explanations, better theoretical models than anything we had produced in the humanities. I still think that's, uh, uh, that's the case, but in the process that led me from evolution to geography to map making to 
the creation of series to quantitative data and then to exploration of quantitative data, the explanatory aspect has become a lot weaker. The fact-finding, the exploratory aspect has become a lot stronger, but it has done so not by stimulating another surge in explanatory hypothesis, but by almost taking the place of explanatory hypothesis. Not exactly. I, I said that I would exaggerate and I would to make it comprehensible. So, as far as I'm concerned, I don't know whether um, you will agree or you will agree, the question facing literary study today is, uh, is not whether it's a good thing or, or, or a bad thing that you know, there are so many empirical data uh, available, et cetera, et cetera. It's how can we um, work on these empirical data by producing better explanations rather than, th there has been here, well, this is my frustration at this point with the, with the field I inhabit, at times, there is an enormous wealth of data. There, is, there are extraordinary forms of treatment of the data, of visualization of the results. The explanations at times are incredibly banal. But this is not, this is not something that is new here. Mark Bloch, when he wrote the um, Apology for History, at a certain point, he has a footnote in which he's, to he's not criticizing quantitative historians uh, that hardly existed at the time. He's criticizing old school philological historians. He says, do they have to ascertain, to make sure that a certain manuscript belong comes from a certain locality, they will spare no pain, no intellectual, um, there is no intellectual uh, reservation, they will do all they can to make sure about that. And that is, of course, uh, laudable. Do they have to explain its meaning? Then the simplest, most banal aphorism will be enough. When I read this 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 35, I don't know. When I read this, I thought, haha, see, old school historiography. The paradox is that nowadays, a lot of people do, doing empirical literary study are reproducing exactly the same thing. And so I, this is where I want to stop and then we can go uh, 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 more in depth in this direction or in other. This, this is where, for me, the trajectory which this book you know, insofar as an individual's life history can, can stand for a broader trajectory. The trajectory of this book has led to this point, and this point presents us with this very peculiar uh, and new uh, difficulty for literary study. And this is my, uh, my initial contribution to the evening, and now it's up to you. Um, I think I can connect to what uh, Franco Moretti said. Uh, just let me mention that uh, on the occasion of his ESA lecture at the University of Constance in June of last year, I was able to get a lively first-hand impression of the secret to Franco's success, not only as pioneering academic, but also as a person who is able to win the sympathy of even the most resolute skeptics. It actually seems like Franco has two different identities and playing with them. On one hand, he is the optimistic Californian champion of big data who fascinates both computer freaks, usually men, and philologists who are exhausted from their wandering through the hermeneutic maze. But on the other hand, he is also the leftist Italian intellectual with a firm Marxist background. So in one brief, he can say that digital technologies offer a solution and simultaneously concede 
that in the realm of literary studies, the problem which this solution, solution proposes to resolve has not yet been found. In texts, uh, in his book on distant reading, the optimism prevails in the chapters, while the introductions to these chapters, self-critically in the style he has um, um, now also demonstrated, reveal the path of someone who is searching for something, but who has not yet arrived at his goal. I'm thus very curious which of Franco's personalities will be answering my questions here, which I'm not going to ask about distant reading itself, but about the subsequent publication of the Stanford Literary Lab pamphlets. I will refer to two of them, pamphlets uh, number eight, Between Canon and Corpus, Six Perspectives on 20th Century Novels by Mark uh, R.G. Hewitt and Mark McGurl, and number nine, already mentioned, Bank Speak, the Language of World Bank Reports, 1946 to uh, 2012, which Franco co-authored with the historian of science, Dominique Pestre. First to Bank Speak. I'm going to try to embarrass Franco with a compliment. This essay, which has enjoyed a great success thanks to its political implications and has been read, by the way, in the World Bank as well, uh, as I know from my son, who, who is uh, doing some kind of job over there. Um, um, this essay seems to me to be one of the most fruitful examples of a digital text analysis. Why? First of all, because it relates to a clearly defined series of texts, texts which really assemble to a series, the World Bank reports of, uh, of over six decades. Secondly, because the stereotyped programmatic quality of these texts lent itself perfectly to statistical analysis. Third, because the analysis of the frequency of words and other linguistic patterns when combined, which is a necessary condition, with Franco's ingenious interpretive work, truly does reveal much about the power discourse and power practices of one of the most influential global institutions. Here, the prerogatives of the literature professor in Silicon Valley and the Italian Marxist meet and melt perfectly. So this was the compliment. But the conclusion that I make, however, won't please Franco, I guess. The conclusion would be that statistical analyses are a useful means of working through the massive quantities of information produced by bureaucracies. In this field, techniques derived from the study of literature can come to the aid of the social sciences. In other words, digital literary analysis works best when it leaves the literary field itself behind and addresses textual corpuses that are ideally suited for quantifiable analysis. So, Franco, my question would be, how would you respond to the suggestion that one should leave the big unread of, for instance, the 19th century novel by the wayside and concentrate instead of, on analyzing bodies of text whose unique and wholly unesthetic function is to serve as instruments in the exercise of power, bureaucratic text. Now to the second literary rap pamphlet about the canonization of English language 20th century novels. The point of departure for this study is, as the authors state, the dilemma of selection. I quote, of the many, many thousands of novels and stories published in English in the 20th century, which group of several hundred would rep represent the most reasonable, interesting, um, and useful subset of the whole? End quote. The authors compare five suggestions for the 100 best novels of the 20th century, from the modern library uh, boards list to the yearly best-selling works of the 20th century. They arrive, which is hardly surprising, one of the cases may be of a banal uh, explanation, at the conclusion that a professional literary institution favors experimental novels, which for the most part do not correspond to the taste of the broader reading public as represented in its buying habits. Thus, the placement of Ulysses, for instance, at the top of rankings reflects the social position of those 
who made the rankings, in this case, the nine white men that comprise the editorial board of the modern library. In other words, the decision for a novel like Ulysses is merely considered in a sociological manner. It is treated not as a question of judgment, but of preference attributable to a certain, in this kind, privileged class or status group. And of course, it's perfectly fine to do this. And one can, can subsequently use statistics to alter the variables for building a canon of 20th century literatures, uh, literature in order to include more women, post-colonial perspectives, and the broader spectrum of literature more generally. This is uh, something the authors try to do. But this kind of approach raises a question that ultimately goes back to Kant's critique of judgment. What does the calculation of ranking positions have to do with the aesthetic, the inherent aesthetic qualities of a work of art or literature? How do we move from majorities or institutional power positions to the idea of a norm, of a self-affirming norm, in this kind of an aesthetic norm? And can we conceive of a canon of works without this normative dimension? Must we not hold on to a notion of judgment that means something other than measurement of data, however complete the data may, might be? We arrive here at the me methodological problem of what I would call an epistemology of small numbers. What about academic work that by the very nature of its objects does not and cannot work with large amounts of data, huge case numbers, and statistical or algorith uh, algorithmic analysis? Does it really have to justify itself today as an inherently imperfect practice in response to the challenge posed by digital methods of analyzing and the corresponding widely accepted and validated codes of evidence that digital technologies have called into being. After all, we are still bound to deal with singular works and to locate our conclusions in the historical world where, again, the number of cases is just one. We have just one historical world. How is the representational status of singular historical events and of singular canonical works to, un to understood to, to, to be understood and stated. Uh, what about the cultural value, the social function, and I would add the full legitimacy of conclusions that move from the small number to the larger whole? And this is precisely what canon building is for. How is then representation in an exemplary sense supposed to work when it rests not on a majority position and not on the congruence between the represent, uh, representative and represented, but rather upon a categorical distance between these two entities. This also seems to be very relevant in political and practical terms. It is a problem facing democracy theory as well as democratic practice right now. So it's another kind of distance. It's the distance between what is represented and the representation a very important distance uh, in to my view. By the way, it's also an old Marxist problem, namely the problem of richtiges Bewusstsein, or the correct kind of consciousness. I'm excited to hear what you, Frankie, have to say about this. First of all, dear Franco, thank you very much for coming to Zurich uh, and for publishing the German translation of Distant Reading uh, in our really small publishing house, Konstanz University Press. It's a great honor for us that you are one of our authors. Uh, and in spring 2017, so next year, the next book, the series of Stanford Literary Lab pamphlets, uh, will be available in German translation. So thank you very much again, and thank you very much for the 
Collegium Helveticum, uh, Literaturhaus uh, Zurich, uh, Monika and Michael for organizing all this. That's fantastic. As everybody can see, uh, we didn't change the title of Distant Reading, even if it isn't a German one. So we leave it, we, we have left it just like that. The title is simply too elegant, too programmatic, and too emblematic uh, to be translated. Actually, the title is suggesting a new way of reading, which has been, for a lot of scholars, a guideline for their research. So this is my first of, I would say, three or four. The, the last two of the, them are a little bit interconnected or related questions. Uh, if you read the 10 essays of distant reading closely, you may be surprised by the fact that the major part of them presupposes a much closer look to the text than the title is suggesting. Just to give one ex example, I could give uh, uh, some more. The final conclusion of the brilliant text, The Slaughterhouse of Literature, depends on a connoisseurship of quite a lot of detective novels to figure out that the history of the genre as a sort of evolutionary tree uh, with a particularly, uh, particular literary example for the survival of the fittest, uh, that's a very brilliant idea as well, depends on the existence of clues. Or if you take the chapter maps in your fantastic book, graphs, map, maps, trees, abstract models for literary theory, you are quite far away from a distant reading. Without returning to a more or less close reading of the novels, the topographical structure of literature, which is in many ways significant, cannot be analyzed. So that leads to my first question, which is a very simple one or technical one if you want. What could be and what should be the right distance for a distant reading? Should I imagine the distance like a camera lens? So I was working quite a lot with photography, so I was um, always thinking about photography, even uh, uh, reading your books. Um, just like a camera lens, which can be focused following the very particular idea of the image. And shouldn't we give up at a certain point, the distant point of view, in favor of a much closer look at the texts? So the second point. I have the impression that you change in your own books the perspective that you are shifting in a way between a distant and a more or less close reading. When I was reading, uh, for example, your best-selling book, The Bourgeois, between history and literature, I was quite amazed by the fact that the program for which your name already stands for cannot be found in this amazingly rich historical and sociological study. There are only few passages referring to the results of uh, digital humanity approaches. But instead, you will, you will find Perry Anderson, Gramsci, Lukács, and Roland Ward on the one hand, and Cocker, Kozelek, and Auerbach on the other. So you will find this pretty amazing canon combining, just to name a few of them, leftist theory, structuralism, and historical studies, even in distant reading, uh, but not as visible as in the bourgeois. So my question would be the following. I have to conf confess that I've only read three of your books and some of your articles, not, not all of them, uh, but I have the, nevertheless the impression that you are living a sort of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde existence. So in the daytime, you are reading in an extremely precise and instructive manner the patterns and structures of societies. In the nighttime, you are the most brilliant and leading star in the sky of digital humanities. Uh, do you see any relationship, that's my second question, between these two approaches? How can you reconcile Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? Third question. So this leads me to my third, maybe fourth and last question. Maybe I'm wrong, but I'm wondering if there isn't a sort of shift from a sociological approach to the one of the digital humanities. This could be a sort of a shared theoretical conviction or theoretical dream, the one of a hard uh, and exact scientific theory based on, empiric on, on empirical facts. This is the one of the claims that sociological approaches and all together with political issues, that's the, my second point, of the Marxist and leftist theory in a way. You were publishing quite a lot of your articles in the new Left Review, which is one of the most important academic journals uh, or, uh, of leftist or even Marxist theory. So by choosing this specific context, you are emphasizing in a sort of, a sort of elective affinity uh, between the different theoretical approaches. My question, the third one, would be the following. How should we read politically 
the pamphlets and papers of the literary lab. Or in other words, is there a sort of political horizon of these texts which may remain uh, rather implicit than explicit? And what could or even should be the political dimension of the practice of distant reading? The background to my question may be a political one in a different way, so this is my last question. There's another uh, theoretical tradition claiming objectivity, which is, at least uh, in Germany, just reappearing, the so-called empirical aesthetics. Um, the recently founded Max Planck Institute for Empirical Aesthetics in Frankfurt, for example, and I quote the program, aims to use scientific methods to explain the psychological, neural, and socio-cultural -cultu basis of aesthetic perception and judgments, uh, end of quote. In fact, the theoretical issues of the empirical aesthetics seem at first glance very far away from being political ones and la at, uh, at least far uh, from the issues of left theory. So the very last and final question would be, what happens to the political issues of the theory if theory itself claims to be a hard science? And what is the political dimension of the rise of digital humanity, humanities, which, at least in Germany, is extremely popular and far, very far, from the convictions of cultural studies or critical theory. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, I will try to give some answers. Uh, I will not be able to answer everything. I will probably also forget a few things, um, in which case, uh, uh, just remind me, or someone else can remind me. I'll start with um, Albrecht. So, um, <clears throat> First of all, the, this idea, okay, uh, maybe uh, statistical methods work particularly well with stereotyped language and therefore with bureaucratic corpora um, and so on. This is, um, I, I wouldn't subscribe to this as a methodology. It seems to me that statistical methods are interesting because they try to figure out um, central tendencies, but also outliers and you know a whole landscape of possibilities when uh, the whole corpus tends to be always in the same position. Um, I think we were lucky in the case of the World Bank, but it's not, you maybe don't even need statistics because in the end you could simply read a couple of these, um, whereas you need statistics when actually the data differ a lot and then you can organize them um, in that way. Um, one thing, however, <clears throat> that uh, I think we uh, understood during doing that, uh, uh, that work was that even a bureaucracy uh, um, like that of the World Bank and a bureaucracy within the bureaucracy because it's clearly the smaller world of ghostwriters who produce these, uh, these reports, these yearly reports, um, even there uh, things take time in order to achieve uh, their sort of final state and uh, so the study, uh, the study of these World Bank reports turned into a study of how a style crystallizes, and more specifically, of the slowness with which a style crystallizes. And for me, um, in, uh, in thinking about what we were seeing, I mean, these sentences that, that were acquiring more and more of certain features, I thought, oh, this could be actually a very interesting model also to study not simply literature, but all that is institutional in literature. So in that respect, you know, again, uh, different uh, approaches select different features as those worthy and in need of an explanation. 
And it's clear that this kind of approach selects as one of its key features uh, the element of repetition, of convention in literature. Now, literature has probably a lower rate of convention than uh, yearly reports of a bank. I, I think I agree with you. I mean, it would be crazy not to. Um, uh, this, however, um, doesn't mean that that could not be revealing in itself. Uh, in a sense, that seems to me um, um, the horizon towards which these studies should go, it is not uh, inevitable that they will go in that, uh, in that direction. That is to say, if you can, it's not the only thing that they could do, but if we could find a way to make what is the literary average intellectually interesting, that would be a serious historical and also morphological accomplishment on our part. To just to, uh, in a sense, with the bank, we managed to do that because, you know, there was politics involved, and I'll return to that uh, later. With literature, it seems to be uh, a, a little harder. Why? Because there is always the presence of the unique cases, and this is something you brought up, this is something you brought up also at, uh, uh, at the beginning, but again, I'm staying with your question. Um, what is the representational status of the singular in this respect? Well, um, to me, we, in, in the work uh, uh, we are doing, I am doing, at times with others, at times by myself, the singular continues to exist. It's simply no longer the starting point. It becomes significant not in itself, but in relationship to, let's simply say, the average for now. And, uh, for instance, in the very last pamphlet that we published, on uh, um, the emotional geography of London, of London novels in the 19th century, we have found a certain pattern. Uh, London novels, even though London grows enormously in the course of the 19th century, London novels still occupy a very thin slice of the city, basically the West End, the upper class uh, area, and then the city. Fine, we, this, this, is, you know, this is the central tendency of placement of literary geography in 19th century English novelistic geography. Then, at the end of the century, there is a famous, for English literature people like me, novel called New Grub Street, which is about the new intellectual professions, the commercialization of literature, in fact. And New Grub Street famously begins at the British Museum and then moves north from the British Museum. It follows a completely different geography. This is a singular case which acquires its significance as a singular case from its opposition to the, uh, to the norm. As it happens, but it does not have to happen, New Grub Street begins in, with this uh, so to speak, center-north geography rather than east-west. And then as the story moves on, it actually, this initial geography disintegrates and actually the novel falls back into, reverts to the average, so to speak. This makes it doubly interesting, but it doesn't have to be that way. It's not that, but it's just that the uh, individual case acquires its significance against the background no longer simply by virtue of itself. In a sense, you could say that a background has always existed for people who study literature. You never study a, 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 a novel or a sonnet by itself. There's a, okay, this is a way of making the background more explicit, quantitative study. And also of making, and this is a second complicated, you know, what is this background? This background, as I said, it's a, it's a convention. Um, and uh, this is part of a very important, to me, section of literary theory, which is uh, genre theory. 
the theory of genres. The theory of genre is always a theory of conventions. Uh, it can be couched in slightly, but you know, a genre by definition is a set of conventions. They're not as uh, you know, imperative as the law of gravity. One can play with them, but they have to be, otherwise the genre doesn't exist. Fine. Now, now that we have the tools to study tens, hundreds, thousands of texts, we can prepare objects for a theory of genre which are much better than the objects on which the theory of genre has been constructed. In a sense, we can prepare for the theoretical mind an abstract object which is closer to what the theory of genre has always tried to describe while working with individual cases. Will this happen? If you force me to make a bet now, given the state of digital humanities, I would bet against this happening. Because this would require an interest from the theory of genre in the new field that doesn't exist. That it could happen, this is the optimist and uh, uh, that it could happen, it could happen because the things are there. A theory of genres has existed for generations. We now have, if not exactly the perfect object, a better object than the ones we used to have. Will the two things connect? Oh, that, that's not up to me. Uh, I don't see uh, uh, necessarily signs of that happening. That's you know, the problem on which I had ended my previous. Uh, final uh, point, aesthetic qualities and uh, you know, quantitative uh, um, empirical uh, findings. Um, I must confess that uh, I've always had uh, a difficulty, but this, this is a, 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 personal, a personal weakness. I'm not saying this polemically. I've, um, aesthetic discourse, even though I've studied it at the university and actually perhaps one of the two most memorable teachers I had was the professor of aesthetic philosophy, Emilio Garroni, and so I studied the uh, critique of judgment, uh, and so on. I have always found it very difficult to actually work with it, to, to, to turn aesthetic concepts into a tool of my work. Whereas, I've always found very easy, uh, very easy, I've, I've always found uh, difficult but possible to, uh, to use formal concepts. So I bounce back the question to you. It seems to me that um, one of the questions that pre-existed the origin of uh, digital humanities, the development of this new discipline, is what relationship can we establish between aesthetic categories and formal categories, between Kant and prop? Is there a relationship or not? No, but this is an important question, eh? because these are both extremely in-depth attempts at studying something that, at least at first sight, is more or less the same thing. Form and uh, the aesthetic properties. And yet, the two disciplines have never touched. Now, I say prop and form, etc., because you know, in, in my understanding of, of, of quantitative work, uh, you don't just look for quantitative data. I've always tried to push my uh, colleagues and myself to look for quantitative formal data, which have to do with uh, uh, facts of language, but also with facts of uh, narrative construction uh, and so on. So, again, um, how much of the new field of digital humanities is a form of quantitative formalism? Quantitative formalism was the title of the first publication of the Stanford Literary Lab. It was a manifesto, just like and perhaps even more than distant reading. Is the field of digital humanities one of quantitative formalism? No. Um, is it in probably veering away from formalism? Probably yes, unfortunately. But 
more than writing quantity formulas myself, I cannot do. Then, uh, you know, whoever wants to write, writes, whatever. Uh, this is simply a... a but, this, you see, a discipline at its beginning, which can take two very different paths. Towards the study of content, I see, or towards the study of form. Okay. This doesn't solve the problem of the relation between form and aesthetics. Uh, it simply reproposes it in a different scenario, but the problem existed before. Um, Jekyll and I, you're completely right. I mean, there is no question about that. Um, I forced, really forced, my uh, English publisher to publish Distant Reading and the Bourgeois together on the same day because I thought, well, these two books are so different that I, you know, it, it's important that they come out together. Um, this was, you know, sort of authorial narcissism. No one noticed they were coming out on the same day, obviously, I mean, except for me. Uh, those few people who did notice, they, they, how can you blame them? They thought, oh, well, so they're trying to do the same thing. You very correctly noticed that they're trying to do opposite things. Why? Well, well, first of all, because, you know, there is a part of myself that, uh, made, you know, uh, that was formed uh, in a different uh, atmosphere and uh, I still enjoy thinking in those terms. These are very weak answers. What are the relationships between the two sides? And how can they be reconciled? Well, the, really the main reason I wanted the two books to come out together was I will be forced to think what are the relationships and can they be reconciled. I have not been forced to think and I found very difficult to answer this question. Uh, it, the books came out three and a half years ago. So four years ago, I thought, okay, they're coming out in the spring, and then finally I'm going to write an essay in which I exp I never wrote this essay. I've tried to think about it. I've not been able to find an answer. Unfortunately, not tonight, not at all tonight, but in general, uh, the discussion has not been really a discussion that says, oh, here we have a problem. Let's see how we solve this puzzle, this strange duplicity. Uh, usually it's, you know, uh, either pro or contra, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, when, uh, when you're taken by polemics, then you... This is an open issue for me. I keep returning to it. I say, well, this time I'm going to write something that answers that question. And then, you know, whatever I write takes a lateral path and goes in a different direction. And the answer has not come yet. Um, yeah. Uh, there, are, there are possible answers, but I've never found them. For, for instance, one obvious one is the, say, quantitative uh, science-like approach favors explanations. The other, more humanistic approach, favors interpretations. Explanations and interpretations are different things. At times we use them uh, as if they meant the same thing, but they don't. True, of course, uh, these are the two main, but for some reason I, I find this um, not very satisfying. So, you know, if I, uh, if I were to try and answer that question, my first step would be explanation and interpretation. And then the second step never comes. So, you know, I, I leave it there. I have an answer for the, well, um, maybe, for the, um, for the other question about the politics. Um, this has 
um, something to do again with the biography. One cannot escape biography. One should not escape biography. But uh, uh, my formation, my Marxist formation in Italy in the late 60s was uh, um, within a school, Della Volpe Colletti, which was a fiercely anti Hegelian school of Marxism, Kantian, in fact. Uh, anti-Hegelian and in general um, um, you know, took seriously the idea of uh, Marxism as a science. Seriously in principle, then uh, neither De La Volpe nor Colletti ever actually studied uh, 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 anything um, within the realm of the natural sciences, but, but they could inspire their students like me to try and do that. And they did. And I mean, for me, this was and still is, I just cannot imagine a left, and even less a radical left, that whose first desire is to figure out how things are. So explanation seems to me to be so obviously the first um, step to construct a culture of the left. And I've had endless discussions with the people at New Left Review that they sort of, they, they have basically, no why the left that used to be for several generations a champion of the sciences has turned into, um, in some cases, the tractor, in other cases simply a bored, uh, you know, uh, don't bother me. With this field, um, it's, it's, it's hard to understand. So, I don't know how, uh, how much of a question uh, this is, but this is the reason why I um, always find, um, I, I always um, thought that something like the New Left Review, it doesn't have to be that, but, you know, it could, it could, but certainly the New Left Review is uh, but now, after 30 years, it's, it's become part of my own identity. So, uh, again, it's, uh, it's a different story, but that's the... Does that mean that the field of digital humanities, sorry, and I stop here, um, and, uh, and the work uh, at Stanford we've done has a political dimension? No, uh, here, unfortunately, I think that uh, um, the political dimension is kind of, um, in some cases, like uh, the World Bank uh, was, uh, was clearly there, but otherwise, is a little um, um, or very weak um, for good and bad reason. The good reason is that once you start working with data, um, unlike when you're doing interpretive work, when you're doing interpretive work, say Marxist interpretive work with literature, you basically, something catches your attention and then your interpretive machine gets going and you are immediately have a hypothesis, which can be a polemical hypothesis, and, uh, and then you really follow your hypothesis. And you are not blind to what is in the book, but you also have um, permission by the silent rules of the discipline to select your evidence within reason, but you have that permission. Interpretive activity is usually an activity based on positive agreement between the thesis and the data and the evidence. Once you start working with quantitative data and with, uh, you know, um, often you know, unsupervised exploration and treatment of data, you may have a thesis, but you know the relation between thesis and data is often one of uh, contradiction. Uh, the data um, don't corroborate your hypothesis or confuse it, or you know even though they don't point in any other direction. So you just having a different attitude towards research, in which instead of immediately trying to find a hypothesis and then holding to that and doing your work. You just wait and see what happens, what shows up. That is part of the new rules of the game. It should be, 
But especially for people like me, like the first generation of humanities scholars who don't know how to use it, it has proved to be a poison gift because it has, we, uh, unlike, I assume, many natural scientists who can wait for the data to emerge, but that does not um, distract them from their own theoretical construction, um, we are much less capable of uh, returning with a strong, um, with a strong um, explanatory thesis to the data. So, and once you don't have that, you cannot have a strong political um, interpretation either. So, um, in a sense, I, I, as you can see, my answer is a variation of what I was saying earlier about data and interpretation. I think that's the uh, data and explanation. That is really the crux of, uh, of the problem. Okay. Uh, and now it's uh, up to the others. Your turn. Go on stage, Herr Koschorke, Herr Stiegler and Herr Moretti, and you will have the possibility to ask them questions um, if they don't want to talk first. So, and there is this tool called Catchbox. I will not throw it, even if it's pos it would be possible. And if you have a question, you have to talk in that box, and then. Um, yeah, better than I talk into my microphone, and then um, it will. Yes, exactly, it will work. <laughs> ah, wer hat sich gemeldet? Da. Hi. Um. I have a question for Mr. Moretti. Um, I, I have to confess that I haven't uh, read the book yet on your review online, but still, since um, the title of the evening is Distant Reading, I feel free to... <laughs> okay, so my question would be, um, uh, isn't there a problem with um, searching for explanations in your project? Um, since um, the methods of, uh, of um, what you call distant reading that, um, or of big data um, have s certain limitations when it comes to causality. Um, it's, I mean, a big data analysis is great to find patterns in, in genres or in what field uh, or wherever, but um, one cannot uh, construct causal, uh, causal um, connections since it's not possible to isolate what is cause and what is effect. So um, can you really search and find explanations um, which um, heavily use um, talking with Albrecht Koschork, the narrational tool of causality? Yeah, well, look, as, uh, as it happens, uh, when I spoke at the Cabaret Voltaire here a few months ago, uh, my talk was indeed on patterns and on why finding patterns is not enough. And if we cannot explain why the pattern is there and why it has that shape, et cetera, et cetera, we have basically seen a shadow on a wall and uh, just to go back to a famous example, and we're taking it for reality. So uh, I think that uh, I, 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 there are cases in which cause and effect feed into each other, et cetera, but that is itself something that can be isolated and described when this is uh, the case. In many cases, and you know, let's not exaggerate the level of complexity 
of the big data with which literary scholars work. In most cases, with given what we work with, uh, I think uh, one is perfectly justified in looking for a causal mechanism or in looking for, it's a different type of explanation, for a functional explanation. Um, the problem is that um, as the person who was then director of Wired magazine put it in an article of seven or eight years ago, which was entitled The End of Science or something like that. The End of Theory. There is a difference. But actually in which he said that the scientific method is obsolete because correlation is enough. We don't need causation. We don't need models. We don't need theories anymore. Uh, even though uh, um, this person obviously had a certain chutzpah in uh, uh, saying these things, not many people will have the same courage in, uh, uh, in, in saying them, but they operate along the same lines. And uh, um, so I, I, in that respect, I, I disagree with you. Having said that, we have done an extremely poor job in finding good explanations, whether causal or functional. I take over. Um, I'm, uh, I have to say, I'm a linguist. That's not a threat, but nevertheless. Um, and my focus is on history of communication. And therefore, my job always is to consile morphology and history. So that's what I try to do in any case. But there I think the thing begins to be really interesting because then I'm not only interested in patterns, all linguists are only interested in patterns, but in pattern change. And then of course the question, what does pattern change cause? Or, and there I can relate to you, how is, uh, can pattern change in what people do with their language. Uh, do I have to do it more like that? No. It's interesting to talk to a uh, cube, <laughs> okay. Um, but the question then would be, how does it come about that patterns of common language use change? Because there's nobody who does this, but everybody does it. To give an example from my own work, I, I looked on I don't know whether this is the proper English um, expression, death notices, obituaries. 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 And uh, from the 70s, from the 16th, 16th of the last century onward. And there you can see a very interesting pattern change. And the very interesting thing is that nobody realizes it because we, we we know what we are talking about, but we very rarely um, monitor how we are talk about things. So you can, in German, in Switzerland, and in Germany, and in Austria, observe a change from the central meaning or the central sentence in obituaries from um, my beloved husband XY died last week, or our dear brother passed away, and so on to a pattern now going like this, we are mourning the passing away of, we are desperate about the, and so on. So when you look at this as a linguist, and this pattern is really, um, you don't have it in the 60s or nearly don't have it, and now it's about 80% of all death notices in German language area. So what does this mean? This means that people no longer talk about the one who passed away, but about talk themselves. about themselves, <laughs> because they come into the subject position. But to explain why this is happening is really very intriguing, because what we do normally is, well, we, we, we probably do what others did because we liked it. And there a very everyday no notion of uh, aesthetics comes in. People formulate death notices because they read another one and liked it. But where does this start and why do people like things like that? 
And nobody, of course we ask people, but nobody noticed that this pattern did change. Uh, another example, even on, on, on a more, more minute level, is the, the change from, um, oh, no, this is too long to explain. Okay. No, no, but no, <laughs> my, my, my question would be, where will you start there with explanation? Because I think it's, it's interpretation. You have to interpret what's going on in the cultural process. But it has obviously to do with something like um, evolution. So I think you can all answer from different points of view to these remarks. Perhaps. I go first? OK. Um, believe it or not, I also have done a studies of obituaries. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, but uh, on a much smaller scale. And it was only one month of obituaries. So I, I couldn't notice any change in the pattern. And they were American. They were the New York Times obituary. Um, look, um, what, uh, what you described seemed, uh, first of all, very interesting. It seems to me that there are two stages here. The stage of interpretation is you have the words, the actual words of the obituaries. We are now mourning the disappearance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you say, well, what these words really mean is, I am not here writing about the person who has died, or well, I'm, I am drawing no, I am drawing more attention than it used to be the case towards the people who are still alive, some, something like that. You you take certain words and turn them into different words. Very often an interpretation is this, beginning with Traumdeutung, in which you tell a story to a therapist, and the therapist says, yeah, very interesting, but the real story is, and it's a different story. I have nothing against the practice of interpretation. It would be uh, interesting, maybe we can do it later, to see Usually when we think of interpretation, we think of it always in terms of an individual case. Can there be interpretation of large scale of data? You, you have done it, but you know, uh, in, that's, in, what do. that's what linguists do, exactly, yeah. And uh, um, so, um, but usually in the theory of interpretation in the humanities, it's always the single text beginning with Schleiermacher. That's, uh, it's always the premise. So it's interesting to see what happens when you change the scale. Um, but let me just say, you've done the interpretation, then you still have to explain why these change has occurred. There are two different activities. You, uh, and so this, why is it a problem? No, I just want to say, you get new data when you, when you work quantitatively, yeah. you get new type of data. But of the course, problem yeah. of interpretation well, it's just the same. Um, well, except that it's interpretation not of a single text, but of many. Oh, yes. Uh, and usually not of many texts, but of many little segments of text, right? I mean, so the, uh, the, 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 the structure of the object has changed. And I'm saying this neutrally. I mean, I'm, I'm all for the new object, but it, it anyway, it has a, a, different, uh, a different logic. But, you know, it still leaves the question of explanation completely open. Uh, I'd like to add something on the point of explanation versus interpretation. Okay. Then. I mean, that's an int interesting evidence, and it has, I mean, comes to my, to, to my mind that it's somehow uh, analogous to, to what happens to photography. I mean, the, the, the turning around 180 degree. Uh, from from f photographing uh, things out there in the world uh, and uh, to the selfie. So, so um, well, I think your your example blurs the line between explanation and interpretation. Uh, you can you, you can 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 um, um, create this kind of evidence by means of statistics or wha whatever, and you, you can base it on a large scale uh, um, um, study. B but then every interpretation, every explanation would be an interpretation. There's no other thing in, 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 in 
with respect to cultural phenomena because it's just something you can't because you don't have the the conditions for 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 ex experiments uh, as you have in the in the science it's just it's one development you, you, the, the the case number is one i mean you have many cases of uh, obituaries uh, but the case number of this development is one so you the only thing the only approach you have is interpretation uh, uh, and I think th this is the case with m practically all cultural phenomena. And the, the only answer, I mean, if you don't like interpretation, then you abstain from explanation, um, 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 actually. This is what, what usually happens. So a, a scientist approach to cultural phenomena would be uh, not to explain things, and this is what happens in in, in many parts of uh, uh, quantitative uh, research. They they just they see patterns sometimes, and and uh, and they usually they don't they don't risk this kind of explanation because they are afraid of interpretation. Would you like to add? No. Okay. Okay. I stand up because I like to be on, on the movie <laughs> with this. <laughs> I don't think, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I have a, pr a question for Professor Moretti. You know, when you are in Google Maps, you, go, uh, you can focus in or focus out, right? So you, go, you, have, you, go, you can go from a close reading to a distant reading. But if you click the little man, you, know, you are already inside the landscape, you know, and the, everything changes. You know? so I, I want to ask you, what do you think about the idea of Professor Eco? Lector in fabula, the reader in the text. Uh, ma uh, that idea, if I remember now uh, correctly, the um, that idea <coughs> arose because Echo was trying to um, explain how narratives how stories can work and they can work because of a cooperation of the reader they there is always gaps and uh, and so the lector has to be in the fabula in the story in order for the story to cohere um, I, honestly uh, Whenever I have worked on uh, um, narrative, I have not used this hypothesis. So I, it's not that I've invented it, but I follow people who basically think that narratives are already perfectly well organized, or you know, reasonably well organized mechanisms that n that do not need do not need this cooperation. Even though, of course this cooperation may happen and may have results. But this, um, um, to, to be frank, this is not something I've thought much about for quite a while, so uh, more than this slightly scholastic answer, I, um, I, don't, uh, I, I don't think I, 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 I can give uh, more than that. No more questions? So I think it's the perfect moment for Monika Doman yes. for a statement. Very good. I think I can stay here. Okay. If this is fine. Thank that you so much. Um, mm. It's easier for, for okay. everybody to okay. see you. Good. If they see you. Yeah, um, thank you so much. Um, again, uh, Franco, Albrecht, and Bernd. Um, just a short comment um, at the end of a really interesting discussion we had now and um, months before. A couple of weeks ago, um, I've been in Hanover, in Hanover, German city, and, 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 and have, I've been able to sit in a really fancy, really modern new VW wagen, Volkswagen. And this Volkswagen had a 
head-up display. I don't know whether you have ever seen a head-up display. This is the newest thing uh, developed by Volkswagen. It looks like a Fata Morgana in the windows. You don't have to look down to see the whole cockpit. You just look um, through the windows and you see uh, it's a head-up display. Um, the reason why I could uh, sit in this car was I was uh, in a committee actually viewing a um, project, Digital Humanities Project in Hannover, um, sponsored by the Volkswagen Stiftung. And at the end of these days, I would say, I would like to, that there will be, would be more Marxists. Um, that the digital humanities people would be more Marxists. The reason why I, I would like to have that is that they have questions, that they want to, that they have question, real questions, and I miss that a little bit. Um, so, um, the first book I read um, by Franco Moretti was Bank Speech. And it was for us historians, it was a really interesting book because it was a book about the bourgeoisie of the 19th century. And there have been written a lot of books about the bourgeoisie, <laughs> about bourgeoisie in the 19th century. Um, but this book was quite interesting because from our point of view, it's about the mentality of the bourgeoisie. So I would say, um, um, the, you, you did a history of mentalities. Uh, you started to read Anal, and you thought about uh, cliometrics, but, and I think Anal scholars would, have, um, would, would be really delighted, but not the cliometrics people, but the histo his history of mentality people. So for me, this is a really interesting history of mentalities because the novel offers um, deep insights into the mentality we couldn't uh, get to other sources. Um, good, I like that. This is a teaser for the book, uh, Distant Read, and, and, and the teaser for the book um, by Constant University Press. Um, there are really interesting uh, introduction written by you, Franco, um, um, introduction to the old texts. And these texts are, this introduction are really interesting from a history of knowledge point of view. Because you, um, you, for me it was really interesting to see the evolution of your whole world of thinking. And it became clear that you had this question of, of space, of geography, and of open up the, uh, the, the canon. Um, which led you to this, um, to this digital humanities. And I think what happened, you are now in the canon of digital humanities. In Hanover, everybody was citing you. You are now canon. And you did really interesting work about how a canon um, develops. So I think um, for me, the whole digital humanities question is of interest because it brings us back to the general um, question of our methodology. And that's what we discussed um, when, when you have been here. Um, actually, we didn't expect that um, kilometrics comes back. We didn't expect that, but it happened. And what it happened? What else happened? That a lot of linguists, corpus linguists, are now called head of the digital humanities um, departments. And <laughs> that's what happened. So we have we have a. Um, kind of a new um, structure of a field. And it's, it, it's interesting now for us um, to discuss what this means for, uh, for interpretation. So um, I think um, disturbance is always good. And everybody should read um, The Bourgeois. Everybody should read Bank Speaks. These are two excellent uh, book and excellent paper. And distant reading, at least for the introductions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Monika Doman. Um, just a little anecdote before I pass the word to Michael Hagner. I just checked on Goodreads how well you do with distant reading. I don't know if you all know goodreads.com. It's a great tool for finding out how books are received in the world, well, in the English-speaking world. And um, the best you can get is five, but nobody ever gets five. I mean, a four is, like, amazing. Girl on a Train good got four. Um, that doesn't say a lot about the book, but it says a lot about which readers comment on which books. And Franco Moretti's Distant Reading got a 3.82, which is really good. Um, <laughs> for example, Saturn Island from Tom McCarthy, a book I really liked, got only a 3.4. 
um, and allegories of reading by Paul de Man got a 3.92. <laughs> so there's still a bit of um, distance. It's still a f exactly, exactly. So now, last words to Michael Hagner. Yeah, thank you very much um, to all of you uh, who, who made this uh, event possible. And uh, I think I will, uh, I will uh, just, just add two, two things, just a reaction to what we have been <laughs> discussing recently. First of all, I mean, there is this um, ongoing accusation of uh, digital humanists to be apolitical. Um, and to subscribe to a kind of believing in data. Um, and, um, and I think this is right, but it is unfair. Um, because this tendency of being unpolitical is not at all restricted to digital humanists. It is uh, much more widespread. And most of the humanists, in fact, have become woefully apolitical. So, in this respect, the digital humanities do not deviate from what some people might call zeitgeist. So, that is my first remark. The second remark is a um, couple of, uh, of uh, months ago, I met one of our um, most uh, distinguished um, scientists, physicists, uh, not Dirk Kelbing, another guy, um, uh, another guy who works with uh, big data. And uh, we were talking, and then at a certain point, I mentioned a book I published a couple of years ago uh, on a private tutor around 1900, and I said, look, this is a case study. And I said, oh, I'm very interested in case study. As, um, and uh, and case studies are really important for my work. And I said, you know, I, I can imagine because you want to collect many case studies and then make a kind of sample. And I said, yeah, that's right. So, so, um, so the more case studies I have, the more I can say, let's say, about um, sexuality and education around 1900 because this is what the book is about. And then I said to him, okay, uh, I perfectly understand your point, but uh, uh, listen, um, my interest in case studies is completely different. Uh, I also want to compare case studies, um, but I'm interested in the differences. And I think that only through an analysis of the differences, I can come up with something as a kind of maybe not representative, but a more coherent and plausible view of what is the relationship between sexuality and education in a given time period. Um, I have to confess, and maybe this is my weakness, although I was, as most of you know, also educated in the sciences and in brain research, and of course we worked with statistics there um, and with data. Um, I have to say maybe it's my weakness but um, but my, um, my 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 difficult is to under, my my difficult in understanding is what is this kind of either representative uh, or or this kind of generality that my colleague wants to find in collecting these uh these uh these um the, the, the these uh, the, these case studies um so so i i would uh, and and i asked him you know what 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 is that and he said oh you know i mean it's 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 in the it's in the data and and i i mean i'm i'm still struggling with that um and i think that even if you work with that you do not uh, come up with a uh, with a uh, or, or I think we will have a hard time to come up with a sound answer to this kind of dualism, which is a bit similar to the dualism to the mind brain dualism uh, in in the neurosciences and in and in uh, philosophy. So um, I think we continue to think about it. We continue to work on it. 
Um, and as always, um, it is important to interrupt and to uh, and to bring your brain into a different direction. And I think now the direction is apero and a glass of wine. Thank you very much for coming and hope to see you soon again uh, at this place and in other places. Thanks again to Franco, to Bernd and to Albrecht and to you, Geza. Applause